So welcome everyone tonight to our August virtual speaker series. Um, my name is Renee Rogers. I'm the head curator at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. And tonight we are here with Charlie DeHaan, who I'll, I will introduce in a minute. But before we jump into the presentation, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you don't mind to keep your mic muted throughout Charlie's presentation and also to turn off your video, um, that way, the camera and the Zoom camera will focus just on him when he is speaking and there will be no distractions. If you do have any questions that you want um, to ask Charlie, please put them in the chat. Um, my colleague, Scotty Almany, who is running tech, will keep an eye on the chat and be sure and have those questions ready for Charlie at the end of his presentation. Um, the only other thing to say is to have a look if you look in the chat box now, you will see that we have links to um, Birthplace of Country Music Museum and other Birthplace of Country Music entities, social media handles, which is a great way to follow along with us and know what is coming up next with us. And also, if you enjoy this program and others like it, um, we love your support in all ways by just telling people about us, by advocating for us, um, by visiting us, and if you feel so inclined by donating to help us to support programs like this. All of that information is in the Zoom chat. But, for, but now for the, the reason why we are here, um, we are here with Professor Charlie Dahan. He is the Recording Industry Professor at Middle Tennessee State University and co-author of the books on Janet Records and Star Piano. He has recently been involved in several historic preservation and National Register nomination projects, including ones for King Records, Jeanette Records, Hank Snow's Ran Rainbow Ranch, Fame Studios, and Stax Museum Soulsville, all of which are really worthy historic preservation projects. So be sure and check those out online. Um, prior to his time as a recording industry professor, he was the A&R director at Shinachi Records. Close. Did I pronounce that correctly? Shinachi. It's close. Shinachi. Shinachi. A booking agent with the Roots Agency and co-owner of Larchmont Recordings. So he has been deep in the world of music recording and is going to have a lot to share with us. Tonight, he is specifically looking at Henry Glover. Um, and the title of this is The Musical Alchemist of King Records. Um, Henry Glover was one of Sid Nathan's earliest hires for this Cincinnati label in the late 1940s. And he was one of the first African-American executives in the record business. Um, Charlie's going to go into lots of detail and tell us about his career and how he got there and the impact that that Henry Glover had. So welcome, Charlie. We're really glad to have you here with us at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. Thank you very much. And I also add your institution as a fantastic place to visit. And um, I've had the opportunity many times and I love it, so. Oh, well, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, so let's jump straight in because there's a lot to talk about. Um, I mean, I didn't go into all the details yet because you're going to tell us that. I mean, but Henry Glover had a really extraordinary career. He was a musician. He was a songwriter. He was a music arranger, an A&R professional, and a record producer. Um, and before we delve into those accomplishments, though, can you tell us a little bit about Henry's early life and how he came to the music world? And we'll also start the PowerPoint now, please, Scotty. Yes, if you want to go on the second slide. So this year would have been uh, Henry Glover's 100th birthday. He was born in 1921 in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is famous, of course, for the Hot Springs, uh, probably most well known as the place that uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, went uh, to sort of recuperate from uh, his polio. Charlie, can I, can I interrupt you for one minute? A couple of people have said that you need to be a little bit louder if you don't mind to move the mic in. Okay. Is that better? Oh, yeah, that's way better. Thank okay. you. Um, so, yeah, he was he was born in Hot Springs, Arkansas um, in 1921. So this would have been his 100th birthday. Uh, his father was an attendant at one of the uh, bathhouses uh, in Hot Springs. And um, he was very interested in, in music uh, rather early on in his life, uh, much to the chagrin of his parents who didn't necessarily see music as it wasn't your sort of prototypical, you know, the devil's music kind of thing. It was more they had a they had a more sort of clear path for their children to go into sort of education, which he will eventually study. But he tells a very interesting story 
uh, when he was in grade school, about seven or eight years old, the local sort of elementary school, which of course was segregated in the 1920s, uh, hired a, a harmonica company to come in and teach the children how to play harmonica, which when I read this, I thought that was awesome because when I went to grade school, we had to learn the recorder. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I would have loved to learn harmonica. And uh, so they gave every student a harmonica and every student a book. And he talks about how his sister was sort of teaching him how to play harmonica. But he had this really interesting sort of observation at a young age because they they the teacher came in and taught in a segregated auditorium, the white students on one side and the, and the black students on the other side, the same thing. And he says, you know, that was to him, that was no good. It made no sense because you couldn't learn from each other, right? You couldn't share your talents. You couldn't share your frustration. You couldn't sort of peer sort of teach each other. So that, and that, and I think that's a lot of sort of the theme of, of his career sort of the idea that there's this artificial barrier placed uh, uh, you know, by society between, you know, people based on races or sexes or religions or whatever, when really they should be getting together and sort of sharing ideas. Um, at, at, towards high school, he takes up tr uh, cornet and then trumpet, and he has a lot of great teachers. He references a lot of very influential teachers, especially music teachers. And then in uh, when he becomes 18, he goes to uh, Alabama A&M, uh, and uh, for education and music uh, as, as sort of his main study. And that's really where he gets, I would argue, was sort of conservatory worthy music education. He has fantastic music teachers at that school that teach him harmony, composition, uh, theory. Then of course he's playing in bands, band leader, uh, band leading and stuff like that. He starts actually playing in some uh, local sort of big bands or dance bands. And then upon, almost immediately upon graduation, goes to get his master's degree up in Detroit at Wayne State. I think he said that his major there was education with poli sci, but he took a lot of, in his one year there, he, he sort of, he ends his time there after a year. He takes a lot more sort of music classes uh, there. And eventually uh, he's, his, his talent um, uh, leads him to sort of getting his, his first, um, sort of full-time uh, gig with, I think, Buddy Johnson. And uh, he moves to New York uh, with, but he plays with the Buddy Johnson band. He plays in a bunch of other outfits in New York in 44 and 45, including uh, working with and collaborating with Thelonious Monk in a, in a big band uh, before he lands with really what will be sort of the pivot point in, in his career, uh, working with Lucky Millinder's band. So in addition to being the cornetist or trumpet player in the band, He's also the uh, a songwriter and arranger. And while in Millinder's band, uh, and this is this is a story we'll sort of follow the thread to. Um, he's asked to uh, write a theme song uh, to a Mom's Mabley sort of short film, uh, Boarding House Blues. And so I just want to sort of put a pin in that because we'll we'll sort of get into that a, a little bit later on. So it's while he's in Millinder's band, which was signed, uh, I think, to RCA Victor. Uh, that um, Sid Nathan, who j had just started King Records and was looking to branch into R&B, um, can't sign Millinder because Millinder is, is um, under exclusive contract uh, to RCA. But Millinder, who's he's not really a musician, he's not really a songwriter, he's, he's more of a businessman and a band leader, uh, talked to Sid Nathan about working with his musicians who are not under contract, uh, his saxophone singer, Bull Moose Jackson and Henry Glover. And so that's sort of how Glover uh, gets into sort of King Records. So that's, uh, that's I think I, it's about, you know, I can go into more depth, but that's kind of getting you up to where, where we're, where we're going to get into him making some records. Well, and you, you said, um, Charlie, that Sid Nathan w wanted to get into R&B from King Records. So what kind of record label was King Records? I mean, what were they focused on before that? And and when Glover started working with Sid and at King Records, what was his role there? Sure. So if we go to the next slide. So Sid Nathan, um, uh, who was a, a sort of Jewish businessman in Cincinnati, and that's sort of important to sort of point out, because I think that helps to sort of uh, facilitate a lot of what we're discussing is, you know, understanding that he's not a part sort of the mainstream of the city. Uh, he has a variety of different sort of uh, entrepreneurial successes and failures. Um, 
uh, in, in Cincinnati. And eventually he opens um, a record store called Sid's Record Shop. Uh, I think the story goes that someone owed him money and instead of paying him cash, they gave him a bunch of used jukebox records uh, that were largely hillbilly and race records. And uh, he sort of opened sort of a little corner store and the record started to sell. What's important to sort of point out or sort of get a sort of contextual understanding of of understanding why Sid Nathan was able to be successful uh, and really, I think, almost pretty quickly. Um, you sort of have this convergence of situations happening at the same time. So if you look at the record industry in the 1920s, there's this great sort of explosion of race and hillbilly records, uh, largely due to these smaller labels like Paramount and Jeanette and OK and Brunswick, all of which get decimated uh, during the Great Depression uh, and go out of business. And then you have the rise of radio, uh, particularly in this case, the popularity of sort of the barn dance show, whether it was the, the, the National Barn Dance up in Chicago, or uh, of course the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. Every city had uh, a, a barn dance or a country music show. Cincinnati had, uh, um, had what eventually would become the Midwestern Hayride, Renfro Valley and the, the WWVA Wheeling a lot of ways to get in there. In fact, uh, Henry Glover talks about it in his youth, how he used to listen a lot to this country radio, particularly coming out of Texas, and really fell in love with sort of Western swing. And if you know really anything about Western swing, you know that that's sort of the coming together of so many different styles of music. It's it's traditional string band, it's swing music, it, there's some uh, Mexican and Hawaiian music, right? So it's a coming together of all these different styles. And he really, he loves especially the light crust doughboys, which of course become uh, uh, Milton Brown and his musical brownies, and of course, uh, Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys out of that group. Um, so you have that, that sort of the sort of the ending of sort of race and hillbilly recordings in the 30s and then of course during world war ii there's this rationing of shellac and other materials go to make records and so what few record companies remained rca victor columbia deca were really judicious about what they recorded they wanted to sell a lot of the fewest amount of recordings so they focused it on pop mainstream music there wasn't this robust uh, race and hillbilly recording. And so when Nathan got these used records, uh, a lot of the recent sort of arrivals into Cincinnati from the South were like, you know, Roy Acuff records and stuff like that. Um, uh, and, and so he knew that there was a, a, a vacuum in the marketplace, particularly with uh, the popularity of the, the Boone County Jamboree, which becomes a Midwestern hayride in Cincinnati. So he said, I'm going to record them and I'm going to put them out on my label and have the audacious saying, you know, I'm the king of them all. You know, if it's if it's hillbilly, it's a king. Uh, and it's really amazing. The first essentially four people he, he records, Grandpa Jones, Merle Travis and the Delmore brothers are all in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Who else has that kind of I mean, these records weren't out of the box successful. He, he had a lot of mistakes in the beginning. But, you know, having that kind of talent out of the box uh, is pretty incredible. Uh, so he starts, and it's, it's a hillbilly label, and eventually he's a control freak. He wants to control every aspect of the process. He does not want to rely on outside providers. He had some you know, mistakes with pressing. Distribution back then was unreliable, especially getting paid. So he built his own pressing facility, his own distribution facility, eventually his own recording studio after Herzog kicked him out of the studio. First couple of records, we'll one first record I think we'll talk about was made in Herzog in Cincinnati. Um, and so uh, he, he wanted to have control of everything. And that's sort of the facility that is currently still standing and will hopefully be uh, available to the public in a, in a few years at 1540 Brewster. Um, and so, um, that's kind of how he started the label. And he was always sort of this a businessman. So it made no sense to him, right? So he, he would send salesmen into towns to sell the country records, right, to the white half of the town. But while the, the man was still, the salesperson was in town, why not then sell records to the other side of town, right? The black side of town. So he initially started Queen Records. And actually, I think the first couple of records on Queen were licensed or, or through uh, J. Mayo Williams from Deco. And J. Mayo Williams is the first African-American record executive uh, from Paramount and Deco and Black Patty Records. 
Uh, and eventually, again, sort of these records weren't that great. Uh, and so he wanted to take full control. And, and really, Millinder, the approach to Millinder was really sort of that first step into building uh, an R&B side uh, of the label. And eventually, he realized this artificial divide he was placing on King Records were Hillbilly and Queen Records were R&B. He sort of folded Queen pretty quickly. And every record was then on, on King. Um, of course, later on he has Deluxe and Federal, but we won't really sort of go into that a little bit, a little bit later on. Um, and so the the the, the company uh, becomes dominant in the late '40s and early '50s in hillbilly, uh, country music, and R&B. But unfortunately, uh, for country, uh, this is when Nashville starts to establish itself and uh, honky tonk music starts to take off, and um, really starts to take a lot of his artists away. Um, and he really decides almost not to, to, to compete and also really, and, and to be practical about it or to be honest about it, you know, the best selling hillbilly record back then was 50,000, 60,000, 70,000. The R and B records were selling, you know, the hits were selling hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I think country music's first certified gold record is 1961 with, with big bad John. I'm, I'll put aside Vernon Dalhart's record, the old 97. That's, mm-hmm. That's more myth than fact. Um, but uh, so anyway, uh, Nathan, not to say there wasn't country going on uh, after that, but the label in the 60s really becomes known uh, for soul music, R&B, uh, vocal, uh, vocal groups, uh, funk eventually. Of course, James Brown was the central figure in the 60s, big selling artist, uh, huge impact uh, on the label and sort of society as a whole. Um, so that's sort of King Records uh, in a nutshell. Well, and you might not you might not have a, a thought out answer to this because, um, but you know, you were saying about how the country records were, you know, in the tens of thousands, and the R and B records were in the hundreds of thousands. Is there a theory as to why that was that there that big difference? Well, I, I think. Uh, it's, it's, you know, R and B is is um, it really has has a lot of crossover appeal. So a lot of a lot of whites, especially white teenagers, buy it. It's dance music. It's music of sort of rebellion. The country music you know, is it's regional. I mean, you really don't sell cont- uh, country records back then, even though there's a huge barn dance show in Chicago. But you don't sell those records very well in in Minnesota or New York or Maine or or anything like that. It's it's really sort of sort of regional. So it's really this sort of weird disconnect that it has these huge radio shows that reach millions and millions of people, uh, but the records, for the most part, don't really mm-hmm. sell as well as the R and B records. Yeah, and that's interesting. You know, when you think of this sort of segregation of genres of how they were thinking about distributing them to two different audiences, but certainly those audiences weren't following that. You know, just they weren't not crossing that line. They weren't just stopping on their side and not actually buying the records. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, when um, when Glover joined King Records, um, which, like you said, it's a white owned label in the 1940s, he was one of the first black executives in the business, in the record business. And he's he's now recognized as one of the most successful and influential producers in the business. But of course, he was in um, a segregated America. So what kind of challenges did he face um, in his role and in the industry and how did he deal with them? I mean, did, does he talk about that at all? And, and Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's sort of a great question. Um, and uh, let me sort of first talk about sort of Sid Nathan and, and the building of King Records, which was, this was an integrated workforce. And it wasn't just blacks and whites working under the same roof, you know, in the warehouse, the mailroom, the pressing plant. You know, he, he, he had the uh, opinion that if you had talent and you worked hard, doesn't matter what race you are, you know, you can rise to the job of foreman or, or manager or director, right? Um, you know, he says, a king, we pay for ability and that's what we get. Our people are fine together. We aren't fooling when we say we don't discriminate. And this was a, a, a newspaper article from like 1947, 48. And I see Chris is on here and he, he would probably know exactly where that what year that quote came from. Um, so, you know, he sets up a, 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 you know, a workplace that, you know, you know, does not, does not discriminate and, and, and people, people of all races uh, can and do hold, you know, positions of authority and, and supervision. And 
when when sort of doing some more further research uh, in in his life and career and sort of spending sort of time uh, reading through all these really long sort of uh, oral histories that were done by John Rumble at the Country Music Hall of Fame. I'm looking for I, I, I'm expecting these stories of, you know, uh, overt racism or people refusing to work with them. And, you know, outside of, you know, some sort of lighthearted stories he tells about having to carry a chauffeur's hat when he goes on trips into the South and a time that Sid Nathan beat up a racist person who said something to, to Henry Glover's wife, you really don't sort of see any of that. And so in the, in the, in the, in the workplace, especially, I think a lot of it has to, you know, how Nathan set things up. Now the, the country artists we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, have nothing but great things to sort of say. And there is no stories about them refusing to work with him or finding it odd or, or raising a fuss about it. Um, I think that, you know, they were there before Henry Glover arrives. I think they had success and Sid Nathan, like him or not, I mean, he's a very sort of interesting, very forceful character, but he didn't brook any BS from anybody. You were going to do it his way, whether his way was right or wrong. And he says that whether you, if you don't like it, you can leave. And so if any of these recording artists thought for a minute that they were going to uh, raise a fuss, but all of them have, you know, I, I study, you know, re, you know, recorded hit, record business history. Any person, whether it's Ralph Peer or John Hammond or Sam Phillips, we can find tons of stories about people who hate him or say he did terrible things. I can't find one. Not a single story about a single artist who have any, who has anything but great things to say about working with Glover. That's interesting, and yeah, I mean, because I would imagine that there were probably stories that he that he didn't sort of bring them to the fore in those oral histories. But it's good to hear. I mean, that's quite an unusual um, account of a business of that age being that open and that blatant and and telling people this is who I am and right. you want to like it or not basically it's it's, it's nice to hear that because too often that's not the story you hear yeah and, and again I, I I looked you know everywhere uh and there was just nothing even from him but just again those one or two stories and and he just sort of viewed them as uh you know those were just those were not a big deal. I just dealt with them and mm -hmm. uh, went on my day. You know, it didn't, uh, those couple of stories didn't affect them, but you know, nothing from the artists, you know, nothing yeah. from the artists. Yeah. It'd be interesting. I mean, you know, you were saying about how he, he said that he sometimes had to take a chauffeur's cap with him to sort of slide by people a little bit so that they, they didn't question his, his right to be somewhere. But, um, I've I've watched or, or read a lot about the Green Book lately, and it'd be very interesting to see like how much something like that was useful for him when he was traveling, especially in the South. Right. Um, but he only says that happened like once or twice. So it yeah. wasn't, wasn't yeah, and he was in the South quite a bit uh, recording or scouting or traveling. So um, and again, this is 40s, 50s Americas. So this isn't this isn't. Um, you know, he was in the deep South quite a few yeah. times. Yeah. So, I mean, with that country and R&B sort of mix at King Records, Glover, I mean, I, one of the things you, you mentioned in your blurb for this presentation is that he was, Glover was arranging some of these songs and especially country songs for R&B audiences and blues songs for country audiences. Um, I mean, how did he do this? What was his process? How did he do this? How did he, he make this a success and, and, Tell us a little bit more about that role he had in shaping that influential sort of country blues, country boogie type sound. Right. So, uh, again, I think a lot of it has to do with that sort of wonderful education that he had and him being such a great student uh, of all kinds of music and having a real understanding of the art and science of music. Right. So um, he could pick apart what makes a country song versus what elements you need for it to be, quote unquote, R&B. So just sort of understanding the almost the math. Uh, of it, right? The science of it. So let me just kind of, let me just, when we we'll get to the sort of the country blues crossover, let's kind of start first with, you know, how out of the box he's hitting home runs, you know, for, uh, for, uh, for Sid Nathan. And again, at first he's sort of uh, just 
hired to supervise. And then eventually Nathan says, this is the guy I'm going to bring him in. Uh, I'm going to teach him, uh, you know, for two years, brought him into Cincinnati and, and, you know, made him his right hand man and taught him the business. Um, one of the first sessions that he does again, because Millinder is, is tied to, um, RCA Victor uh, is with Bill Moose Jackson, who's the saxophone uh, singer for the Millinder band. Uh, and the first song uh, they, the first song he does with them is a song called I Love You, Yes I Do, uh, which becomes uh, a, a top 10, top five or top 10 hit. So out of the box, he's making a hit. The interesting thing about that song, and this is sort of a theme in, in uh, Glover's sort of history here, is that an element of that song comes from uh, a contest he won in high school uh, in Sepia Magazine, a songwriting contest he won. Um, I forget the name of the song, but he's like, oh yeah, I remember that song. I had a great sort of a verse or chorus to it. And he sort of, and brought it in. And that's sort of, that's sort of how he has his sort of first hit. So out of the box, um, He's working. So uh, Nathan sort of puts him sort of in charge, officially or unofficially, with a and ring or producing or even supervising the session. Uh, and at the end of the year, he 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 has two huge uh, records uh, for King. Uh, first is Wynoni Harris's Good Rockin' Tonight. And the other is Lonnie Johnson's Tomorrow Night, which was number one. I also bring this up because I wanted to also point this out, because when we talk about sort of these people you know what they do in their time and the su successes they have in their time is historic and worthy of discussion but the influences that we then see after what they do uh makes that even more historical mm -hmm. and i want to point out that elvis presley uh when in 1954 he goes to sun records and records his first two recordings uh that's all right mama and blue moon of kentucky of course were regional hits that when Sam Phillips brings him back, uh, I think in September of that year uh, to do, I think, six more sides, two of them are King records. So Elvis is listening to what Glover and the King people are doing. He records the first song he records is Tomorrow Night, the Lonnie Johnson song. And I think the third song he records is released and is a hit, uh, Good Rockin' Tonight. And, uh, and just, I promised you threads between your museum and King. Lonnie Johnson, if you're ever playing six degrees of separation in the music business, Lonnie Johnson is your perfect starting point because in 25, he signed to OK Records by Ralph Peer, who of course does the Bristol sessions. Uh, Lonnie Johnson also records at Jeanette and then in, has big hits for King Records. Um, in the 40s and, and early 50s and then of course elvis presley so he's he's the greatest person to play that game with <laughs> so with that success then nathan says i'm gonna put you kind of in charge of of everything um and the first session if you want to go to the next slide uh very much like the the uh, jackson record uh, out of the box he hits two home runs uh these were recorded out in la the first uh hillbilly record he does is with hank penny called bloodshot eyes uh, which was later recorded by Wynoni Harris. And, uh, and then less than a week later, he records number one, a song that he co-wrote uh, with Moon Mulligan, I'll Sail My Ship Alone, which went number one. So any country artist on King Records is going to want to work with this guy, mm -hmm. right? He's making hits. And the other part, just like so many other uh, labels, particularly independent labels, a part of your record contract was you also signed a publishing contract, meaning that you wrote a song and that um, King Records publishing division, which was Lois, would then become your publisher, which means they would own 50% of your song. It gets a little bit more nefarious because then also because you're on Lois, you're going to give Sid a discounted rate. So instead of getting two cents in songwriting royalties, he's only going to pay you one cent, half. And then, of course, you only get half of that because you only own half of that. So you get a half a cent. <laughs> Every record label is doing it. Sid was no different than anyone else. And Henry Glover, much like Ralph Peer, a part of his deal with King was that he also got a publishing company, not only for the songs he wrote, but for a lot of the songs that he produced as well. So because, A, there is a ownership interest in both the song in the song uh, by King Records uh, Lois um, and because of this philosophical uh, outlook that Nathan and Glover have that you know 
a great song is not just a great country song. A great song is also a great R&B song. And since I have my salesperson going, you know, to this town to sell the country records on this side of town, I also need them to go on this side of town. So this begins this sort of great couple of years that um, Henry Glover is going to produce, arrange and write songs into both styles. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first one, we'll start right out of the box with his hit, Bloodshot Eyes. Uh, which was um, written by Hank Penny. Here it is on Lois uh, music, sheet music right here. And I thought for fun, we would actually play the original recording here, the 78. This is the original release pressed in Cincinnati uh, on my 1921. So it was created the same year Henry Glover was born. Uh, Star Jeanette uh, Portophone. And I play this for my, I bring this one day to my, my history of recording industry students. And it's like the monolith in 2001. <laughs> like, what is this? It's not plugged in. It's no digital screen, right? It's just, it's not even a record. It's a, it's a, it's a record that if I drop it, it'll shatter into a, a thousand pieces. And, you know, the whole idea of hand cranking and stuff like this. So I'm going to play it. It worked well in sound check. So if it doesn't just kind of put it in the chat box, I'll keep my eye out. But here is uh, the recording made March 9th, 1949, uh, Hank Penny's Bloodshot Eyes. Now just because you're pretty and you think you're mighty wise, Tell me that you love me, then you roll those big blue eyes. When I saw you last week, your eyes were turning black. Go find the guy that beat you up, ask him to take you back. Don't roll those bloodshot eyes at me. I can tell you've been out on a spree. I blame that you are lying when you say you've been crying. So don't roll those bloodshot eyes at me. And so, you know, it, it actually he's uh, the interesting thing about that song also is that he's picking up on kind of the Cajun music craze that was going on at the time with the Jolie Blonde records, uh, Harry Choates and then Moon Mullican had a couple of them. So that's why the accordion there instead of a fiddle. And so, OK, this is a hit in country. Let's get uh, an R&B version of it. Uh, and so here is. Um, So here is uh, his, well, here's the recording right here of Bloodshot Eyes. This one might wobble a little bit, but we'll see. <laughs> So a lot of it, it's kind of the same arrangement, just take the accordion out and put a sax in and and for the R&B add hand claps because this is a dance song. So uh, that's kind of the the big changes. And so, you know, have it owning the same song, they sold, you know, the record to both sort of audiences. The next sort of big record and sort of a landmark record um, for King uh, and really for the history of recorded music was his work with the Delmore brothers. And the Delmore brothers, you know, were a big act on the Opry and they sort of saw their career sort of uh, drop off before they ended up at King. And they actually started on their own to um, play with the, the merging together of sort of country music or, or, or sort of string, maybe a little bit of string band music with boogie woogie sort of piano or boogie woogie rhythms and uh, sort of a casual sort of comment was sort of made when they were in the studio that they should have a dance hit, uh, a dance song. And the biggest dance at the time was a song called The Hucklebuck. 
Now, this is an interesting story, and I and it, it's it baffles me about this whole story. But going back to sort of talking about Lucky Millinder and, and Henry Glover, they uh, he wrote that song for the Boarding House Blues, the Mom's Mabley movie, and then they decided to record it, arrange it into sort of more of a, a, a dance record called Denatural Blues. Well, in Millinder's band at the time was a fellow by the name of Andy Gibson, who then went uh, to um, uh, Paul, was it Paul Williams' big band, and essentially took the song The Natural Blues, and there was a dance that was popular called the Hucklebuck, and they said, well, this will be the official song of the Hucklebuck, but it was, it was Henry Glover's song, Henry Glover and Lucky Millinder's song, and um, back then the way you settled sort of copyright infringement cases was you went to the musicians union and the musicians union said this is totally an infringement uh this is henry glover and lucky millinder's song and they absolutely should get the credit and and the the songwriting royalties and then afterwards this is what i find baffling glover and gibson were such good friends that they basically made it a competition they said okay you own Huck, you you can have hucklebuck and i'm going to keep the natural blues and uh we're going to see who who wins whose version wins unfortunately uh uh the hucklebuck was on an independent label and um and they were quicker out to market and plus it was named after the dance so it's kind of funny that nathan and and glover say to them hey you want to have a dance hit uh let's let's do a let's do a country hucklebuck and so glover said all right i'm going to take uh a, a portion of the original d natural blues which was the hucklebuck and and uh scott maybe maybe just play a bit of d natural blues because you're also hearing the hucklebuck in that probably just take him a minute to find it on that list i think it's the second song the second song okay you want me to try on my end uh i don't know if it'll reverb or something let's see i've made you co-host so you can let me just you might just be having a few little technical difficulties. I'm going to give it a shot and just yeah. immediately tell me if it's like doing weird things. <laughs> So you essentially heard D natural, but I know I was playing at the same time he was. Um, well, I have a quick question, Charlie, before we go for it. So Gibson took the Hucklebuck right. song and Glover and Nathan kept the D natural blues. Is uh, that right? Glover and Millinder. Millinder, sorry. Right. Okay. So um, right. that was not a that was not a King recording, that was on RCA Victor. Oh so yeah, of course. Yeah. When okay. the, the idea comes up for the Delmore brothers to do uh, a Hillbilly Hucklebuck. Uh, Henry Glover already wrote the Hucklebuck essentially and so uh, let's play a little bit of this record which went number one for weeks uh, Owen Bradley and his outfit you know as soon as they heard it ran out with their own version of it Owen Bradley was definitely paying attention to what uh, Glover was doing in, in Cincinnati so let's listen to a bit of Blues Stay Away From Me by the Delmore Brothers and listen for the Hucklebuck it's the third song Guys hear that? No, not now. It's going in and out.
We got it. Thanks, Scott. No problem. Yeah, so that that song has since it's a Grammy Hall of Fame song. It's a it's a songwriters Hall of Fame song. Yeah, I think it might even be on the National Registry, uh, and it was a huge hit. And again, as I said, Owen Bradley, who of course starts the Nashville sound, uh, he went out and recorded this right away. He also had a hit with it at the same time that Delmore's did. Uh, and a lot of what Glover uh, and King was doing, sort of their setup. Uh, really was uh, influential on on people like Owen Bradley and sort of their production style, right? Having a professional songwriters, professional studio musicians, and such like that. Um, yeah. Well, and you know, so we've been throughout what we've just been talking about. We've been talking about some of the artists that Henry Glover worked with, and I mean, I was really struck by how many they were, and and how many were ones that. Um, are very well known. I mean, we have the Delmore brothers, like you just said, we have Grand Grandpa Jones, Le Le Levon Helm and Sarah Vaughn, all sorts of different artists, um, Merle Travis, but especially what, what struck me is that he had this part in the early history of the band and then later with their last waltz concert and album. Um, and we're talking about a pretty wide range of different types of musicians and different types of songs. So what do you think made him so successful when he was working across those wide ranging musical connections with all these different artists and, and different sounds? And because it sounds like he he was pretty golden. Um, his touch was pretty golden when he got hold of a song and was working with an artist. Yeah, uh, this this goes back to sort of the questions that are usually asked about him, like didn't wasn't there like tension in you, you know, uh, being a black man working with country artists and what's supposed to be sort of white music. And, and uh, again, if I don't know if we have time, but we can talk about sort of the integrated sessions he did with Moon Mullican and uh, uh, Calvin Shields uh, and um, some really great records that he made. But, it, you know, he said to the musicians, they saw that I had something to offer and that I knew what I was doing. I knew what I was doing and people had me there because I could be a benefit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I can help them. I can make them better. And sometimes he would do it. He'd be sort of heavy, you know, and I would say heavy handed, uh, but sort of more of in a producer role. And there's definitely examples where he'd sort of let a moment happen. Uh, Bill Doggett's Honky Tonk, which was a number one huge hit. Uh, that was just sort of a jam. And he's like, all right, we got it. Let's get it right. Uh, let's record it right away. Or this one of my favorite records. And again, we don't probably have time for it. This record with Grandpa Jones and Cowboy Copa is called Mule Train, which is just Cowboy Copa singing straight cowboy, you know, straight sort of country. And then, of course, Grandpa Jones, you know, improvising and trying to throw him off his game. It was just <laughs> great. It's a great record. Um, but, you know, letting them just sort of be playful in the studio uh, as, as, as well. Um, yeah, so these, and his, his relationship to the band largely was through Levon Helm. Uh, and so that's sort of the thread from Ronnie Hawk and, and the Hawks when he was when Glover left King and was then at Roulette Records and really had and eventually the two of them started uh, RCO Records. Uh, which was a, he says, is a, a financial disaster. Um, and then, you know, when the, the band decided to do that landmark, you know, video, you know, that video to, you know, concert movies is what James Brown's Live at the Apollo is to live records, right? That sort of sets the tone. Uh, they brought him in because, you know, and he served a lot of sort of roles credited and uncredited in making that sort of, uh, uh, that big event happen and sound so great, whether it was the arrangements, um, working with all the guest musicians, writing the arrangements, writing the horn arrangements and stuff like that. Um, and uh, sort of the, the sort of the last big thing he does is with Muddy Waters, does the Woodstock album, which I think is the only Grammy that he wins in, in his lifetime. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, and, and again, throughout, I mean, he had, um, you know, the, the one of the last records he makes at King uh, is with Hank Ballard. He writes the A side, Teardrops of Your Love. The B side is the twist. And then, of course, uh, you know, that gets sort of stolen from King. But again, they had the publishing on it by mm -hmm. Chubby Checker and and, um, and such. Uh, that's sort of the last thing he does. But then he has a huge hit with Joey D and the Starlights doing the Peppermint Twist because he's a smart businessman. He knows the twist is the big dance and the Peppermint Lounge is where the dance is popular. So uh, it's one of, one of his biggest hits was was that, and then um, what else he did? California Sun, which uh, Riviera, the Rivieras, that was a huge hit for them. But then became sort of a punk standard. The Ramones, uh, um, 
Rancid recorded that song. So he was big in punk music too. Wow. That's incredible, really, when you think of country and, and R&B in the 40s all the way up to punk um, and just that, that through line of, and it sounds to me like from what you were saying, so much of it was about trust on both sides, like him trusting the artists in those moments that you were talking about, but them really trusting him too. Yeah, I mean, it, he was a guy, I mean, I, I really try, I'm trying to think sort of from a historical standpoint, how many other A&R slash producers slash songwriters slash arrangers, musicians, he also recorded as a mm -hmm. vocalist for King. I mean, I really can't think of anyone who wore that many hats yeah. and did it that successful and also in multiple genres, mm -hmm. right? So I might be able to think about maybe someone in R&B, but they didn't also write country hits. Uh, another song we didn't really have a chance to talk about was this uh, song he did. It wasn't a hit with Moon Mullican and Boyd Bennett. And I think Calvin Shields was an African-American drummer on it called Seven Nights to Rock. He wrote that song. He produced it. Wasn't a hit for them, but it becomes the quintessential rockabilly song. I mean, if you go to Louisiana, every swamp pop Cajun band's going to play it. Bruce Springsteen does it. Nick Lowe does it. And that's a Henry Glover original. Wow. You know? Henry Glover, the rockabilly, you know, artist. It's, it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's one of the really interesting sort of stories that you're telling, but that you can also tell with some of the 1927 Bristol Sessions hits is where the song started and where they ended up is so interesting because the way they've been sampled or covered by other artists in different genres and in different styles and that that impact is still sort of happening today is pretty incredible. Yeah. I, I, again, it, and you know, we could we could go on. There's so many songs and things. That well, I, and certainly we have time if you want to play in one more song, like maybe one of the ones he was the writer on, because you know we've talked mostly about him as a producer and arranger, but you have mentioned a few times about him as a songwriter. So just looking at that impact that he had there, if you want to play a song for that, so that we can hear it, I think that'd be great. Yeah, I, I would. I would. The one I just mentioned, he, he recorded it in, in uh, 1956. It was Moon Mullican with Boyd Bennett. Calvin Eagle Eye um, Shields on drums. I don't know if the bass player, there's another Afri there's an African American bass player that he also used on a lot of Mulligan sessions. Uh, the uh, the postman, uh, Ed Conley, actually was the Cincinnati postman and would come in and do, he was such a great bass player for some of these sessions that they brought him in. Um, and again, uh, this this was not, not necessarily a hit on King uh, out of the gate, but then of course, it goes on uh, and has such a sort of second, third, fourth and fifth life. Um, and again, sort of speaking historically, you know, in country music, again, I, I don't want to sort of give it a numerical placement. I mean, for integrated sessions, you know, there's the Taylor Kentucky Boys with the Booker Brothers in 1927. And then, of course, Jimmy Rogers with Louis Armstrong and Lil Hard. We you know country records with African-American performers sold to a country audience. I really can't think of anyone between Jimmy Rogers and then Moon Mulligan with uh, with uh, Calvin Shields that was sort of an integrated country session, you know, sold to a country audience. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a lot of credit to Glover and Mulligan and, and those. But, you know, this was the right outfit for Mulligan because he was such a sort of rockabilly artist. You looking for where it is? Uh, yeah, what was the title of the song? It's called Seven Nights to Rock. Okay, okay. It's, it's, it's down past, uh, it's like towards the end. There it is, Scotty. Yeah. Between I'll Drown and My Tears, which is another song. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I got seven nights to rock. I got seven nights to roll. Seven nights I'm gonna have a whirl. With a different girl Seven nights to rock I got seven nights to roll Monday at Sister Susie's ball Tuesday at the old dance hall Wednesday at the roadhouse inn Thursday at the lion's den Friday at the chatterbox Saturday and Sunday everybody rock Seven nights to rock I got seven nights to roll Seven nights I'm gonna have a whirl Seven nights with a different girl Seven nights to rock I got seven nights to roll Awesome. 
so Charlie, um, we're, we're nearing the end of our time. Um, so there's so much, I mean, it feels like we could actually talk about this a lot longer and I wish we could, <laughs> cause I, this is someone I didn't know very much about before we, um, agreed to do this presentation and I started reading up a little bit on him, but I still feel like there's so many things that I didn't know about him. Um, do you want to talk about anything on this last slide before we move on to the last question? Uh, yeah, this were just sort of other notable sides, which, you know, either were hits or just sort of become standards, you know, Bull Moose Jackson's big 10 inch record, which was huge for uh, Arrowsmith as well. Uh, Otis William and the charge uh, hearts of stone. In fact, really the first time I, I really sort of learned, a lot more about Henry Glover uh, was uh, with uh, speaking with Otis Williams uh, and, and, and sort of his absolute admiration on, on how Glover was more than a producer. He was a teacher, right? Uh, Otis Williams didn't know, wasn't a musician, did not read music, he was a football player. Uh, and he, he writes these huge hits and, and Glover knew how to sort of teach him how to get him to make that song even catchier or punchier and stuff like that. And, and just the admiration that that uh, Otis Williams, the affection that Otis Williams still had for Henry Glover is really sort of what uh, made me want to learn even more. I mean, I kind of knew him uh, as a part of the King story, but never sort of uh, as in depth as I've sort of gotten into. And then, of course, uh, he really kind of, in a way, forced Little Willie John to do Fever, um, which, again, was a hit for King, uh, but a much bigger hit later on when, when Peggy Lee did, of course, the, the standard. Yeah, I was about to ask, is that the fever that everyone knows? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the, you know, the big sort of story usually that we, we tell when we teach this history is, you know, how the pop artists were taking from the, the R&B artists, you know, um, uh, but also Sid Nathan was doing the same thing. He was taking the R&B song and putting it over to country and country over to R&B. Of course, he had an ownership stake on both sides of it. So, you know, when, uh, when other, when other artists would have bigger hits with it a lot of times. And, they, you know, The Twist, again, was a much bigger hit for Chubby Checker than it was for Hank Ballard. But as much as you would like to have had the recording rights to that, I mean, the recording that sold the records, he made the money on the publishing and didn't mm. give Dick Clark a, a discount. He had to pay full freight, two cents. <laughs> so before before we end and um, see if there's any questions in the chat, and remember to, to put your questions there if you have one for Charlie. Um, is there anything else you want us to know about Henry Glover, what's what's one last thing you would like to tell us about him? Um, I I just I, I just how inspiring his story is. Um, just just his, just the work he's done. Uh, that it's still so relevant and sounds so great. I don't really know if there's anything I could say except uh, shame on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Country Music Hall of Fame for not including him. Uh, and it, it just the, just the track record alone, I think, speaks scores for it. I mean, uh, hopefully they'll make that correction soon. But not that he needs it. Not that it's not that we shouldn't still celebrate him. But I can't think of a more deserving figure uh, for recognition uh, than Henry Glover. Yeah, and that was actually one of the questions I did have: was is he recognized in these halls of fame? And, is he recognized in any of any? Um, He's in the Blues, Blues Music Hall of Fame, Blues Music Hall of Fame, and okay. the city of Hot Springs um, has uh, dedicated a park, and he's on the uh, Walk of Fame, I think, and uh, Cincinnati uh, Mayor John Cranley, who's been a wonderful advocate uh, for the, the King Records preservation, really is the driving force behind it, uh, has, has also uh, in the past declared it Henry Glover Day in Cincinnati, and I know as we start to progress with um, – the interpretation of that building. Henry Glover is going to be a huge part of it. We will celebrate him and we'll celebrate his legacy uh, in the place that he made such uh, history. But you're right, it's incredible that the country music and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fames have not done that. Well, thank you so much. That was really interesting. I want to, I want to know much more about him. And oh, this is great. This last um, slide gives people places where they can follow up some of it. Um, and I guess this is your main sources, but someone also, Chris Richardson had also put in the chat that newspaper article that you'd been talking about. Yeah. Um, the record firm here smashes Jim Crow, workers' positions pay keyed to ability. So Cincinnati Post, March 21st, 1949. Yeah, and Chris's, uh, Chris's blog is a great resource. He's clipped every magazine that mentions King, newspaper clipping uh, chart, 
for King uh, is really is an incredible uh, web. Uh, you really can spend hours on it. Uh, so it definitely was a great resource. And I'm glad to see him here. And I hope I, I hope I didn't make any mistakes, Chris. So <laughs> that's the hard part of doing a presentation with someone who who knows the subject well. <laughs> So Scott, and I'll put those couple of links in the chat too. I'm going to repost all of um, the links and things. Um, so I'll, I'll pull these two out as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Scotty. No problem. Right. So I don't see any um, questions that have come up yet, but um, we'll give people a couple of minutes to put some questions in. And I wasn't sure. I mean, if, if someone wants to jump in and ask a question, they're welcome to do it, but um, you can also put it in the chat. Um, but tell, tell us a little bit while, while we're seeing if people have some questions, what's happening next on that preservation project? I mean, where are you with it and what happens next? Well, uh, a lot of important things have happened. Mostly important is the city has acquired the building. It was going to be demolished or the a petition was put in to demolish it. And uh, Mayor Cranley and the city council, you know, really took the bold step of threatening eminent domain uh, on the owners and then eventually did a land swap deal. And as soon as they acquired it, they went in. The, the, the building is was a disaster. I had snuck in a couple of times. Uh, there was the roof had caved in. There was black mold. It was everything that you could do to a building by ignoring it for 20 years. They went in right, right in and shorted up, put on a new roof. And then um, uh, they appointed a committee with what we call our three kings, which is Otis Williams from the Charms, uh, Philip Paul, who was a, a session drummer on, on some of the country sessions that I talked about as well. Uh, and of course, the, 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 uh, the great Bootsy Collins, uh, who played bass with uh, James Brown before moving on to Greener Pastures with Parliament and of course the rubber band. Uh, those, those three king, former king artists are on our committee and, and we meet and a, we're right now sort of in the sort of starting uh, phase, but the most important thing is that the building is still standing. Mm -hmm. It is uh, it is shored up. It's got a new roof, and we just want to make sure we do the right thing for the King legacy, uh, the artists, the families of the artists, and the employees, um, and that we make a, a place that's really sort of unique and um, uh, inspirational. Well, that sounds really exciting, and. We want you to keep us posted. And, and if there's ways for people to support that project, um, yeah, let us know. Yeah, soon. Well, and one thing I'm, I would like to add, um, so this last link is a link to the playlist on, it's an Apple Music playlist that you made. Um, and even if you don't have an Apple Music account, you can at least access it and see everything on it. Um, and yeah, it's, I didn't know how far, you know, his reach was at all before before this. And I'm, I'm definitely going to check out that playlist a bit more. Yeah. And again, a lot of these songs he wrote or co-wrote. So it's not just him as sort of the producer A&R man, but a lot of times he's also writing or co-writing the song mm -hmm. and sometimes even playing on it, piano. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that he recorded uh, where he sings or, or stuff like that. So he's, he was doing everything there. Yeah, I recognized a lot of the songs that I had no idea. So. One, I was gonna. That's one thing I was wondering: is did he did he also still act as a musician during all of this, or or did he sort of leave that behind? But it sounds like he was just a Renaissance man. Yeah, he was uh, at King. He put out a couple of records. None of them sold uh, <laughs> pretty well. I don't see him on any charts. I have a couple of them, um, uh, and a lot of them he's singing on it. Um, mm -hmm. and it sounded good to me. I don't know why he didn't push it. Why he didn't convince the the promotion staff to push it harder? But um, <laughs> Yeah, and in a couple of sessions, he talks about him playing piano uh, on it. Um, I don't know if he played any trumpet on any of these. Maybe with Millinder, when Millinder signs, maybe he said, said him. But, you know, he, he did everything. I mean, everything. Yeah. Ran the New York office, too. I forgot to talk about that because he moved back to New York. Holy cow. And he ran the New York office and the studio there. Uh, and, you know, so he was doing promotions and sales and stuff like that. Phenom I mean, it's incredible stuff. So we did have a question pop up from Andrew Hunt. Um, what are some of the best resources for reissues? Um, the best thing usually are the ACE reissues in Europe. The U.S. ones, I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about the owner of the sound recording copyrights here in the U.S., but ACE has done quite a few. All of them are available on Spotify and, and Apple Music and Tidal. So... Uh, you just type in the artist name and it might have, you know, 
Tiny Bradshaw, the King Mears, or or stuff like that. So I mean, it's pretty much all the the big artists and the big records are readily available on the streaming services. Um, I have a couple of the Ace reissues, um, R and B After Hours, quite a few. I think there's even a, uh, oh, there is one. Uh, oh, Chris, the King Records box set, the one that has actual recordings of Sid Nathan's A and R meeting and sales meetings. So you can hear Sid Nathan. Um, uh, I don't even know if that's streaming, but it is, it is a great, it's a great, um, it's great to hear Sid Nathan basically say, I know everything and you guys know nothing and you're going to do it my way, uh, <laughs> whether it's right or wrong. And and that, that four, four CD box set is one of the few um, excellent productions out of Mo Lytle's IMG um, uh, business. Otherwise I would echo your point that Ace UK is uh is where to get um the the, the not only uh, do they often go to the recordings and the acetates but they uh the the history notes are top notch yeah the, that's if you haven't heard this the sid nathan marketing meeting and a and r meeting and henry glover is in one of them and you can hear him on a couple of them but um yeah i love it. i love hearing things like old recordings of things you're never supposed to have heard i guess <laughs> um and then we have another uh, question that popped up from Bailey George via um, Jessica Stiles. So what's the story about Henry Glover's own label, Old Town? So Glover had a few labels. Um, he had Glover Records. Um, and then when he was at Roulette, he had an imprint called G. I don't know where Old Town falls in, in that sort of chain of stories. And then, of course, he had RCO with Lee Von Helm. Um, but I mean, mostly in the in the '60s, is his big stuff is on is on roulette, um, which is you know Morris Levy, which is, that's a story in and of itself, right there. Uh, if you like gangsters and and story, that, that Morris Levy, wow, what a what a crazy guy to be. I mean, he worked for two crazy guys, Sid Nathan and then and then Morris <laughs> Levy. But Morris Levy was a whole different whole different animal, whole different animal. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, the whole story about, about old town. I'm sorry. I've just seen someone, someone mentioned bear family as another yeah. super. Yeah. Bear which family, bear family yeah. does so many of the releases that tie into our story too. Yeah. Uh, they do great work. Um, uh, uh, yeah, they, that's a great label. But the, the most of the ones I, I'm sort of looking back, I'm like mostly the ace, the ace stuff. Uh, and that's usually a lot cheaper than Bear Family. Um, and as Chris mentioned, the liner notes in there. I think I think even uh, Billy Vera might have written one or two of them, and they're really good liner notes. Awesome. Oh, oh, and then there's where is it? There's an actual box set. I forget where I put it. Uh, it's called the Henry Glover story. And I don't even know what the label was that put it out. I had it here somewhere. Uh, it's a four CD box set, mostly of the songs that he wrote. And it does have boarding house blues on it all the way through. Oh, I don't know where I put it. Um, but yeah, there is a box set. It's, it's usually you can find it on eBay. Uh, and it has great liner notes about Henry Glover. Um, I don't know if I put that in my sources, but if I didn't, then I'm going to reveal now that that was a great source for me as well. <laughs> So. Well, thank you. Thank you again, um, Charlie. This has been so interesting and um, we want to definitely hear more about what's happening with that preservation project. And I, I know that you've talked to us a little bit about it, but keep us keep us informed and and we'll maybe we could maybe we could do a blog post or something about it on our blog, because I'm sure people would like to hear more about it. And uh, uh, thank you guys actually on a, on a museum project I worked up on in Indianapolis uh, for Jeanette Records, you guys donated that great um, Herbert Sweet fiddle that has Jeanette Records written in it. I, I know yeah. when, when I was there when you're first opening and, and, you, and um, uh, who showed it? Dave Lewis showed it to me. I was like, you sure I can't take that from you? That's not really a, <laughs> that's not really a birthplace story. That's a Jeanette story, but it's still yeah. sitting up there. It, it, I don't know. It's got WOPI in it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's we've got on loan there for it's been there for a while and um we extended the loan because of covid so it, it'll be there i can't even remember how much longer but through throughout the whole exhibits so. yeah yeah i think it closes in december it was extended because of covid uh it actually was supposed to open the day everything got shut down march 12th <laughs> it's a great timing yeah um, 
yeah. So again, thank you for that because that Herbert Sweet Fiddle is sweet. We, uh, we yeah, actually, absolutely. We actually talked to them um, right when we started our museum talk yeah. radio show the, at and, the Indiana Historical Society and got to talk and got they showed us some pictures of it and it looked really great in the exhibit. So we were glad we were glad that it had a place to to stay for a while. Yeah, because he saw that picture in my book. Because uh, but it does have Ernest Stoneman's name in that too. Charlie, so it is connected to us. <laughs> but it mostly says Jeanette Records in it. It so. does, yes, you're right. <laughs> well, thank you again. Um, this has been really interesting. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been here with us tonight. Um, really quickly before you sort of leave the Zoom room, let me tell you a few of the things that are happening. One is to just tell you that we are not having a virtual speaker series in September. And that is because it is the month of the birthplaces, or BCM's Bristol Rhythm and Roots Reunion Music Festival. And we are all too tired and too stretched to, to do anything else that month. So, um, or at least anything before a festival. So we won't be having the virtual speaker series in September, but we will be back to it in October and we'll be having ones in October, November and December. So keep an eye out on our newsletter for those. Um, a few other things to be aware of if you are in our area, um, or actually for this one, you don't have to be in our area. Um, Thursday, August 5th, so a couple of days from now, is another live Farm and Fun Time. It is sold out, but you can watch that on Facebook Live. Um, that starts at 7 p.m. Then on Saturday, August 7th, just down the road at the Bristol Sessions Hotel, we have our Road to Bristol Rhythm concert with Amethyst Kia, who is blowing up right now, and those tickets are hot tickets, so get one while you can. Um, Saturday, August 21st, we have a camera crash course on digital photography with Brianna Fillers, a local photographer from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's on our website under birthplaceofcountrymusic.org backslash events. And that is to go along with our current special exhibit, which is about 10 type photography. And then on Thursday, August 26th at 12 p.m. we have our Radio Bristol Book Club Book of the Month, which is Weaver's Daughter by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley, which will be followed by an interview with the author. So be sure and tune into that on Radio Bristol. So that's what we've got coming up in the rest of the month. So thank you, everyone. And um, we'll talk to you again in October. Thank you, everyone, for, show, for coming out. Good seeing you all. <laughs>